I met my wife when I was 26. I suppose it can be considered ironic, really, that it was a funeral which brought us together, especially considering the events I would experience upon moving in with her. I was never really a believer of the paranormal. I guess if we have to apply labels to ourselves, mine would be of a skeptic. Of course, like most people, I had watched various videos on the internet, read stories of hauntings, and occasionally indulged in the odd horror film or two. But my interests were only ever viewed from an outside perspective, and could only really be considered academic at most. Without a frame of reference, I found it hard to believe in these stories, and view them as anything but stories. That would soon change, however as we quickly fell in love, and I moved in with her shortly after. She had told me about the house before I moved in. She had been living there for 10 years, before she had even met me. And by that time, there was a lot to tell. Her friends had all experienced something there. They each had their own tale of the unknown. One of her oldest friends had an experience while staying over for the night, witnessed what can only be described as the outline of a woman move slowly through the room before dissipating abruptly into the darkness. He never slept alone in the house again. My soon to be stepchildren would often, when young, point to an empty space in the corner of a room and innocently ask, who is that lady? A horrifying experience, of course, but discountable on its own. If it were not, for the other children who would always say the same thing. Every single time they visited our home, it would always be the same question, and it would always be the same corner of the room. Things would only get worse. I remember how my wife recalls the odd smells which would materialize as if from nowhere. The unexplainable noises which would break the peace of the night and foreboding feeling of not feeling quite alone when you knew you were the only person in the house. It did not take her long to reach out to a paranormal investigation team. They attended our home with Kieran O'Caffey a paranormal investigator who enjoyed a brief stint of fame after being featured on Most Haunted, a television show which ran here in the United Kingdom. They brought along a psychic, who not long after entering the home had an unnatural aversion to one particular corner of the room, the room which would soon become my new bedroom, and the particular corner where the children had witnessed the lady. Without any prompt, the psychic explained to my wife that the previous occupant of our house, a woman, had ended her life via rope in that very corner. She finished her reading of the house by sketching a picture of the apparition, a drawing my wife still keeps to this very day. Suffice to say, all of this did little to alleviate my wife's concerns. And this is where I come in. Poor naive me, brazen and full of all the misplaced logic that only a skeptic would apply to a situation which so clearly required it. Well, I even decided that our bed would go in that corner of the room. Looking back now, I can only lament at my childish bravado. My first night was unremarkable, of course. There was the typical excitement about me moving in but nothing which could be considered otherworldly. At that point in my life, I knew I wanted to be a writer, but lacked any real motivation. That did not stop me, however, from tapping away at my laptop until the early hours of the morning, while my wife slept soundly in the corner. Around one in the morning was when it started. It began slightly at first, but it quickly became more noticeable as the minutes progressed. A sound, a noise of sorts, it sounded like scratching, and it was coming from the direction of our bed. I paused my work for a second and turned quickly around in the darkness, my ears directing me towards the source of the noise. My wife was still sleeping in the corner, her face concealed by the shadows. 
She lays stationary, blissfully unaware of the unnatural sound, which had itched its way from the wall near her head. Now, however, I gazed into the blackness of the room. The noise could no longer be heard, almost as if it were never there. A fleeting shimmer of imagination jolted into existence by my wary, fatigued mind. The room all of a sudden felt tight and confining. The walls, although stationary, appeared to have moved an inch while I was busy, closing themselves while restricting my movement. It was an odd sensation, one which burrowed deep, one which felt as if it would be with me for quite some time to come. Chalking the whole feeling up to exhaustion, I closed my laptop and quietly climbed into bed next to my wife. Predictably, sleep came soon. What are you doing? I inhaled deeply, my body swaying somewhat as my consciousness returned to me. Baby, what are you doing down here? It took a second for my mind to return to me, but when it did I found myself awakening abruptly, standing on my feet in the middle of our pitch black kitchen. It's just after two, are you okay? Even through the darkness I could see the concern etched into my wife's beautiful features. Her eyes were wide and telling as her lips repeated her plea for answers. Are you okay? It took a second to collect myself, my confusion crippling in a heavy sort of way. I am, I began, my mind struggling to comprehend what was happening. I think I was just sleepwalking, I added. My words sounded more of a question than a statement. My wife looked me over once before the concern drifted from her face. Shh, it's okay, she whispered, extending her arm out to me. Let's get you back to bed. I weakly offered my arm and allowed her to guide me back upstairs to our room, where I quickly fell back asleep. Up until this point, I had never sleepwalked in my entire life. I talked in my sleep, sure, but never sleepwalking. That was new to me and it was a disturbing sensation to say the least. It followed me into the next day and persisted throughout. Somehow it felt more than just sleepwalking. Somehow, I just knew. The day passed like a dream, and before I knew it, night had fallen once more. Do you want to talk about it? My wife asked, lying next to me on the bed. I shook my head. Even though the room was silent, I still felt as if I could hear the scratching. No, I'm fine, I lied, as I pulled the covers over and turned over. Okay, I love you, baby, she whispered. I love you too. It's dark, and I'm standing in our kitchen. I inhaled deeply and took a second to steady myself, my limbs shaking as the realization of what happened crept slowly through my body. This time my wife wasn't there to comfort me. This time, every single drawer had been removed from their cabinets and were now perched precariously on the various surfaces above. What is happening? Confused and distressed, I began to quietly slip each drawer back into the cabinet, which housed them, and then slunk carefully back upstairs to bed. Just before my fragile mind drifted back into the sleep of abyss, I felt as if I could hear it again. A scratching, tearing and cutting somewhere deep within the walls. I did not tell my wife of this second transgression. I thought she would only worry. Ironically, this seemed to make matters worse as she quickly picked up on my silence throughout the day as we continued unpacking the rest of my belongings. What's wrong? She asked, sitting next to me on the sofa. I struggled to comprehend an answer. After all, what was wrong? I couldn't even fathom a response, let alone formulate the words required to convey the feeling which lingered deep inside me. My lips moved, and I found myself saying the first thing which came into my mind. I think we should move the bed. She nodded slightly at my words. She knew what I meant by them even though I never actually had to say it. Okay, we can move it first thing tomorrow. One more night, 
Okay? Because I'm shattered. One more night. I could make it one more night. The hours passed and again the sky turned black as we drifted peacefully off to sleep. Baby, stop, please, you're scaring me. Suddenly I was aware that I was not in bed. I was standing, but was still in the room. A few seconds later, I realized I was standing upright on the bed facing the wall. I looked down at my wife, the horror clear even through the darkness. What was the only word which seemed to come? She was shaking, obviously. After a few moments of silence, she collected herself and brought her arms up to me. Come on, come here. Confused, I once again allowed myself into her arms as she guided me back into the mattress. Her hand moved up to my hair as she began to run her fingers lovingly through it. Shh, it's okay. Go back to sleep. My mind quickly sank back into nothingness. In the morning, she explained exactly what happened. She had awoken suddenly in the night when she realized that I wasn't laying next to her. After rolling over, she was shocked to find me standing upright on the bed, silently and still staring at the wall with my back to her. She tried to call out to me before I finally answered. Understandably, this shook her up quite a bit. I went on to divulge the second instance of my sleepwalking, and soon after we moved the bed from the corner of the room. To this day, we've never slept in that corner again. It's been six years since then, and we still avoid going anywhere near that corner. My sleepwalking has not happened since we moved the bed, and thankfully, I've never heard the scratching again either. To be honest, I try not to think about those three nights so long ago. It's hard to because I never really got any closure. If I had seen a ghost, if I could have at least pointed a finger, yep, ghouls, if I maybe had seen a rat or a mouse, I could have explained away the scratching, but there was nothing. It all just stopped just as suddenly as it had begun. The second we vacated that particular corner of the room, and I guess looking back on it now, that's the most horrifying part of it all. I will never know why these things happened, and even more hauntingly, I will never be able to predict if they will ever happen again. And that is the thought which lingers most during the dark nights, repeating with my mind as I tap away at my keyboard and hoping to God that I never hear that awful scratching ever again. As much as I do believe in the paranormal, I don't usually get the opportunity to experience it firsthand. I want to start off by saying that being from Hawaii, there are many superstitions that I still follow to this day in respecting my ancestors and understanding my culture. I work in the film industry, and sometimes where we shoot tends to be in certain sacred locations back in the old Hawaiian days. For example, if it was just me on a hiking trip, I would have done to chant an ollie to grant me safe passage. However, this job pretty much disregards those types of locations if it's considered a tourist area. We were filming at Waimea Falls, which has a rich history of the paranormal, located on the island of Oahu. As the day was wrapping up, I found out one of the crew members left some equipment back at the falls, and I volunteered on retrieving it. It was completely dark, and it was about a 10 minute drive via a quad to trek up the narrow path towards the falls. I had a colleague help me in locating it in the forest to no avail. I kept feeling eyes were watching us, and we shouldn't linger any longer. We decided to leave, and got back on the four-wheeler to head back to base camp. As my colleague was trying to fix the gear, the headlights were beaming our exit. I glanced over to see a shadowy figure standing in the middle of our path. Thinking in my head, that's not right, I looked away hoping it was only an illusion of some kind. I blinked hoping I wasn't crazy, and I turned to see if the figure was still there. To my horror, the shadow figure stood 10 feet away from me blocking our path in front of the headlights. Mind you, these lights were on high beam, illuminating the front road and all the darkness 
tucked far back except for the figure. Trying not to cause any alarm to my colleague who didn't want to notice the figure, I quickly closed my eyes shut and told him to hurry up and drive. He asked what was wrong, but I didn't budge until we were back in our well-lit environment. I felt ashamed for causing a disturbance even though it was unintentional. I sent a prayer before my departure and hoped the being could remain at peace, but that experience was a shocker for the first time. Thankfully, it didn't follow me home. This incident happened last year in 2019. Unfortunately, I don't have any proof for the fact that I was completely chicken under those circumstances. Mahalo nui loa for reading this story. And please do not piss off any ghosts on your excursions, people. About eight years ago, when I was a senior in high school, me and two of my very close friends decided to break into this house that was down a back road that we passed every day to go to one of their houses after school. The house was kept up, but no one had lived there in over 10 years at the time. And by kept up, I mean the lawn was mown and the lights were always on. It was pretty well known in the community that no one lived there, but the bills were paid by someone and no one had lived there in years. So being teenagers, we decided to check it out after dark. There was a driveway that led to a covered garage in the back of the property that couldn't be seen from the road. We pulled in just after 11 p.m. and made our way back to the garage and we parked. The entrance was clear and there wasn't a soul around. Since the garage was behind the house, we made our way to the back entrance of the house and noticed there was a plywood slab that covered the back door's windowed top half. We proceeded to pry the cover off the door and revealed that the windows had been broken before, probably by another group of teens in the past, and we had our entrance. Once we climbed through, each helping the last through the window, and into what was the kitchen at the back of the house. Once in the kitchen, we moved to the eerily tidy living room of the house, which was sort of infamous for being the room in the house with the lights on. There were magazines all dated to 1998, stacked neatly on the table in the middle of the room, and it was fairly clear that an elderly woman had once been the occupant. There was a sewing station and decor, to suggest this. We felt safe at this point. We had made it in there, and there weren't neighbours or anything for half a mile in either direction. We sat around for about a half hour, freestyle rapping, laughing and smoking a joint. We toured the rest of the house and ended up back in the living room. It was overall pretty creepy, but pretty typical too. Just seemed like a normal household that hadn't been changed in 15 years. This is where it gets weird. We were still cutting up in the living room and had actually turned the lights off because we were filming each other with my Lenovo laptop, something we did for fun all the time back then. So we could relive it and show our friends that we had braved the empty house on the back road. When all of a sudden, there was a sound like an old guttural truck trying its hardest to stay idling. The uneven rumble of an engine. It's hard to explain. I personally thought for a split second, it was the air unit's fan outside the living room wall, or something along those lines. We froze in place and looked around at each other in the dark. Terrified faces stared back at me, illuminated by the glow of the laptop. After 10 seconds of the rumble, there was a squeak and a heavy truck door slammed shut right outside the living room wall. Now we scrambled. No hesitation, we bolted for the front door that also connected to the living room, because climbing through that back door window would have been difficult in a panic, but the front door had actually been nailed shut. So we turned and ran to the other side of the house, in the back bedroom that was also on the back side of the house. We all three froze and didn't move a muscle. The engine rumble wasn't audible anymore, but we were trapped like mice. 
There were huge bushes covering every window, and the front door was nailed shut. The only way out was the way we had come in, but we were literally scared motionless. We sat in the bedroom waiting for the police or owner or someone to call out that our fun is over and to come out, but that never happened. There was a window to the backyard in our hiding spot, covered by a huge bush. I personally was directly next to it. My buddies very close to me, almost huddled around me. They could see and hear everything. And let me remind you that after the slam of the truck door, it was absolutely silent inside and out, besides us scrambling to the back. All of a sudden, chills go up my arm and back, and I slowly turn my head to my friends, who looked like they were about to keel over from fright. Footsteps in crunching leaves were coming, slowly, directly to the window that we were hiding behind. They stopped as close as they could, without walking directly into the bush, and we froze again. The footsteps we heard approaching the window were undoubtedly bipedal. After the steps stopped outside the window, we were immobilized with fear for nearly a minute, maybe more. We sat there waiting for the steps to depart or someone to call out at us, which never happened. The steps stopped outside the window and never moved. Only then did we silently agree. It was time to back out the room slowly, as we were horrified by what exactly could be staring towards us in this window. And at that moment, we threw caution to the wind. We got up, slowly backpedaled away from the window and made our way into the hallway outside the room and into the area before the kitchen where our exit was now back in sight. I think all three of us knew that something was very wrong about all of this. And I think getting caught by the police or the owner wasn't on any of our minds. This was very surreal and felt almost like a prank because there's no way people of authority would be haunting us in the way whoever was outside had been doing. So fed up of what felt like an eternity of unease and terror, we decide to bolt to the window in the door in the kitchen all at once and go out together to either face what had been tormenting us or run. Once we were outside, we counted down from three and ran past the huge bushes to the left where our stalker had been. I couldn't help it. I had to turn around and look. I turned, and all I saw were the lights beaming from the window broken up by the bush, and illuminating a patch of ground covered in what appeared to be undisturbed leaves. This made my whole body crawl in a way I've never felt before or honestly after. We made it to my car in the garage, and I backed out and tore away as fast as I ever had. There was no vehicle outside. There wasn't anything. There was a deafening silence and stillness. We are still very uneasy talking about it to this day. Even writing this makes my eyes water and my skin crawl. I've always been a man of science and a huge skeptic, but I can't explain that night. There was something so wrong about everything. Needless to say, we never went back. I've never actually told anyone about this, but when I was 11 and my siblings were in my room playing Halo, we had two controllers, so we're taking turns, and I was just watching my brother and sister play. My room had a bathroom connected to my sister's room that always paranoid me, so I left the door closed and locked. I noticed that the door was open and went to close it thinking my brother may have opened it. And then it was my turn, so I started playing. When I finished, I noticed that the door was open again. I told my brother very adamantly, keep this door closed, stop opening it. He and my two other siblings claimed they didn't open it. I closed it again and sat on my bed, staring at it, seeing why it was opening. All of a sudden, the door slams open, and I see some cloudy shadow that looks like a person of about five foot eight move into the bathroom. 
I didn't say anything and just bolted out of the room into the living room. I refused to go back into the room for about two months and slept on the couch every night. As I said, I never told anyone about this, but I assume my mum sort of knew what had happened. Because about a year ago, my mum was telling me stuff she saw in the house and never mentioned it because she didn't want to scare us. My dad also had a similar experience in that house, like seeing someone lean over him when he woke up at night. That was the only experience I had there. And now I'm a bit of a skeptical on the paranormal and think perhaps it may have been my imagination or maybe airdrops opening the door. But I guess I'll never know. My husband and I bought a townhouse back in September of 2017. And we've had super weird things happen since. Most of these experiences have happened on our second story. For background, where the stairs come up to my office is immediately to the left. Then there is a long hall to the right with the hallway bathroom. The laundry room just past that is my son's room on the other side and the master bedroom at the very end of the hall. The access to the attic is in the master bedroom closet. As our family goes, it's me, my husband, our son, and our two large dogs. When we first moved in, our son was barely three years old and had just started making full sentences. He would be playing all day without any issues, but whenever it started to get dark outside, he began getting nervous and wouldn't want to be in his room. He'd come downstairs at one point saying, Mummy, do you hear it? Hear what, kiddo? The baby's crying, Mummy. My son is an only child, so you can imagine my confusion at this time. I came upstairs with him and asked him why he was hearing it from, thinking he may be hearing the neighbours through the wall. He took my hand and pulled me towards the master bedroom, stopping just a short over the threshold. He pointed to the darkest corner of the room and said, Over there. The baby's crying over there. My body went numb. I tried to brush it off and told him there's no baby there and he's just imagining it. This persisted for about a month before he finally stopped talking about the crying baby. During this time, I had been doing research on our house and there had been no deaths in that house that I could find let alone any kids that lived in the house before us. A few weeks after my son stopped mentioning the baby, I started hearing scratching noises above my head in the attic. I told my husband and he thought we had raccoons or some other animal living in the attic. He went up a few days later, but found nothing. I'm normally a heavy sleeper, but at least twice a week I would wake up to hear a faint scratching noise directly above me. I did my best to try and ignore it and go back to sleep. This seemed to work as we hadn't had an issue for a while up until recently. I have always felt somewhat uneasy on the second floor, but I just attributed it to my past paranormal experiences growing up and being a little paranoid. Now I'm thinking my senses were on point. A few months ago, my husband and I we're talking about how our son had this weird affinity for the crying baby when he was younger. And I had mentioned that one day when I was taking a nap, I woke up abruptly being sideways on the bed with one leg hanging off towards the closet, almost like I was being dragged towards it. However, I don't remember being pulled at all. All I do is flop around a lot in my sleep. So I brushed it off. After I told my husband about this, he frowned a little bit and said he had a weird experience too recently. Apparently, he woke up one morning around 2.30 a.m. and saw a figure standing by his side of the bed. He said it was all black and he couldn't really make out a face or any distinct features. He went to kick the figure, thinking maybe someone had broken into the house and his foot went right through it. This freaked him out a little bit, but he's a firm believer that if you don't acknowledge paranormal things, they can't do anything. So of course he rolls over and goes to sleep and doesn't even think to mention it to me until I told him about my own experience. 
The whole time we've been here, the dogs will randomly get spooked or will stare at something that I don't see. Every once in a while, our wolf hybrid, who's typically scared of his own shadow, will get very upset, and his hair will stand on end, and he will emit a low but vicious growl. Our other dog is a Malinois slash Black Lab mix, but she's getting old and is 10 years old now and doesn't really do much other than sleep on her bed and try to get all the pets and treats from us. And this brings us to the present. Yesterday, there was a decent storm that came through our area. It was semi dark out and thunder every once in a while. I'm working from home during the virus pandemic and my mum had come to pick up my son around 11.30 so that I could work in peace without my son continually bothering me. A few hours later, I'm listening to a podcast while working and I hear a faint mumble that almost sounded like, Mummy? The chilling thing is that it sounded exactly like my son. I turned around to tell him that he needed to go back to his room and not bother me while I was working. But as I was turning, I remembered he wasn't even home. I was here alone with the dogs. There was no one behind me and no one down the hall. At this point, I try to brush it off, thinking my mind is playing a trick on me. When my wolf hybrid starts losing it, all his hair stands on end. He gets between me and the door and starts doing this low growl. This freaked me out a little bit, but I told him to stop, which he listened to and laid back down, but without taking his eyes off the hallway. About an hour later, I was in the zone with work and was talking to a co-worker on our team chat. They sent me something funny enough to make me audibly laugh. I then heard a tiny giggle that sounds exactly like my son coming from his room down the hall, who still isn't home at this point. I nearly fall out of my chair with how scared I was. I got up and checked all the rooms upstairs, but I was home alone like I had thought. I had to get back to work as we were starting to get busy, but I was on edge and straining to hear if anything else was happening behind me. 10 minutes later, I hear the crash of something relatively small, but still loud downstairs. My dogs run down the steps while I follow behind them. My PlayStation controller which was originally on the charging stand behind the TV, was in the middle of the living room floor. This made my blood run cold, as we had not had anything physically moved yet, and I was having a full-blown panic attack. I called my husband, who was already on his way home, and said he would be there soon. When he got home, everything seemed to have stopped. This all happened from 2 to 4.30 in the middle of a little thunderstorm. I've looked into it, and from what I can gather when something can mimic voices, it's typically evil or demonic. Should I be worried? What do I do in this situation? I don't want to scare my son, and we can't move, but I'm extremely paranoid and scared to be home alone right now. The first story I'm going to tell you is a story relayed to me by my late father, and it was something that happened to him and my eldest half-sister when she was a teenager. Allow me to give you some background. My half-sister Giselle had always been able to see ghosts since she was a child, and being able to do so has made her feel like she was cursed, especially since the entity she sees always appears solid and showed up unexpectedly during the most unexpected of times. My oldest sister, Isabel, seems to share that curse, since she experiences the same thing. I, however, can only see shadows from the corner of my eye, as well as feel others' presences when I'm alone. And yet I look, but no one's there. I just pray that I never encounter a ghost up front like my older sisters have. At the time of this event, Giselle was 14 years old, and accompanying my father one weekend, as she was scouting for a new house to move into since Giselle's mother was pregnant with her sixth child and things were getting cramped in their current residence. My father noticed that Giselle had been clinging to his arm very tightly ever since they entered the front gate 
and had been glancing around with clear unease. According to my father, the house was a two-story house, comfy looking and quite spacious, only with a few repairs needed in a room or two. And the price the owner was giving him was much lower than he had expected it to be. However, my father couldn't shake off the feeling he had as soon as my sister entered the house. The atmosphere felt heavy and so wrong. Add to the fact that Gazelle had seemed reluctant to enter the house and was no longer looking around, but constantly turned to look over her shoulder. As the tour of the house progressed, my father saw that Giselle's unease had melted into complete and utter terror. Her face extremely pale, that he thought at one point she was going to faint, and she practically had his arm in a death grip. Giselle, however, refused to say a word when he asked what was wrong, just shaking her head and practically gluing herself to his side as she trembled. My father knew just by the terrified look on Giselle's face that buying that house would be a mistake. Once the tour was over, my father informed the owner that they wouldn't be buying the house as tempting as the low price was, but thanked him for his time. When my father and Giselle were in the car, he noticed how her eyes were fixed on one of the windows on the second floor. And because he knew that she could see something he couldn't, he asked her what was wrong. My sister tore her dark eyes away from whatever she had been looking at before turning to him still terrified. Dad? Her normally high-pitched voice was barely a whisper. There was a woman in black following us around while we were going through the house. She was floating, and she had a black veil over her head, but I could see her face. It was white, so white, and her eyes, they were pure black, but at the same time, blazing with hatred. And she had a snarl on her face and followed us at a distance, but stopped at the foyer after you and I stepped out the door. She was watching us from one of the windows on the second floor just now. She was just filled with hate. My father had started driving as Giselle spoke, and he felt a chill run down his spine once she finished. They didn't bother looking at any other houses that day, despite my father having listed four more to look at. Because he told me that what Giselle had told him rattled him more than he wanted to admit, and he felt quite drained. I don't even want to think about what would have happened if they'd have brought that house. The next story was told to me by my parents and takes place in a building that my parents and I were residing in shortly after I was born. It seems the building was quite haunted and they had only learnt about it after moving in. All the people residing there had their own stories to tell. It was just before lunch on the day my parents brought me back from the hospital and I was asleep in my mother's arms. Just as soon as my parents stepped in their flat and were about to insert the key into the lock, they were startled when something collided with the door, barely missing my father's head. The noise jolted me from my sleep and I began to wail. They whipped their head towards the winding staircase that led to the upper floors and my father ran to the foot of the stairs to see who had thrown the dirt, but there was no one about and they would have heard someone running on the tiled floor, or any of the doors slamming, but it was completely silent since it was a weekday and the neighbours were at work. After ushering my mother inside, my father took a look at what had nearly struck him, and saw it was a ball of dirt, compacted perfectly into shapes, as if someone had taken the time to form it and harden it with their hand, before hurling it in his direction. My father took a gardening trowel and scooped it up, before showing it to my mother who was trying to comfort me since I was still crying up a storm. When the neighbours arrived from work several hours later, they saw my father standing at the foot of the stairs looking up. They asked what was wrong, and he proceeded to tell them the events of the day and showed them the ball of dirt that had caused the fuss. Little things would happen as the months went by, some that were harmless, others not so. Sometimes when my father was at work, and my mother was carrying me as she moved about the house, she noticed how I kept shifting in her arms and laughing, as if there was someone playing peekaboo with me, even though she knew that we were the only ones there. 
Other times, she would hear me squealing with delight in my crib when she had her back to me, and when she turned around, I would be reaching into the air as if trying to grab something. One night, while both my parents were laying in bed, gazing at me as I slept between them, they heard the unmistakable sound of someone walking into the bedroom and stopped outside the door. They heard the unmistakable sound of the doorknob rattling, as if someone was trying to get in but the door was locked. The rattling stopped, only to be followed by a light knocking. My father turned on the bedroom light, demanding to know who it was, but the knocking stopped and there was only silence. Nothing else happened that night. However, neither of my parents got any sleep. The next morning, they checked all the doors and windows, and everything was locked. We moved out of that place that same weekend. I've never seen shadow people from my peripheral vision. They're always a few feet away from me, but right in front of my field of vision. I've only ever seen them at night, when my room is quite dark. Generally, something rouses me in my sleep. I'll open my eyes, and there it is. A dark, humanoid figure. Which I always initially assume is a family member out of bed, and trying to awake me for some reason. I'll then ask them what they're doing, or why they awoke me. But when they say nothing and remain still, I'll grow annoyed, and continue repeating my questions until they just gradually dissolve before my very eyes. This is the moment where the fear sinks in, and I realise this clearly wasn't the family member I thought I was just aggressively speaking to. My point here is that these dark humanoid figures are already present, so I don't see how they materialise in the first place. As I lay beneath my covers, I kept my eyes on the corner of my room at the foot of my bed. As I stared into the patch of darkness and shadow where the two walls met, I felt like my eyes were playing tricks on me, because it looked as if the shadow was undulating. I kept my eyes fixed to the space, and slowly but surely the shadow grew larger and morphed into this big, dark, round humanoid figure. I say rounded because it was kind of like a featureless, heavyset Santa body, made out of super dark shadow. I'd never seen anything like this before. He was wearing a hat. He had a kind of large sombrero, and just stood there motionless once manifested, and seemed to be made completely from shadow. As though the thing just pulls in and sucks in a patch of deep shadow from a space in the room, and uses that to form his space. It was a really trippy experience, and I was a kid and quite scared, and remained stock still, staring in shock for at least 20 seconds, trying to gain the courage to scream out to my parents in the next room. I still remember counting to three in my head before I finally had the guts to scream, Mom. I closed my eyes while screaming, so this time I wasn't able to watch the thing depart or dissolve. My parents took mere seconds to enter my room, and once they were there, my eyes opened, and I looked straight back into the corner and the thing was gone. I never saw one like that again. The others are always quite skinny. One thing for sure though, each time I've had an encounter with a shadow person, even though I've now had quite a few, I'm always equally and unsuspecting at the time before and I always feel the same initial frustration while not receiving a response, right up until that cold fear takes over upon their eerie and unexplainable departure. I had been experiencing many strange sounds and feelings last year. My cousin had a party at my house, and without my knowledge, had brought a Ouija board and played it, Keep in mind that my room is in the basement, and every sound in the house can be heard from there. Most of the time I can tell exactly what it is. It was just me, my mum and sister, and two dogs in the house. I had been hearing loud footsteps all around the house, mostly when it was just me home. And they were heavy, like a man's footsteps. Too heavy to be my mum or my sister, 
and I began to smell this rancid smell floating around the house. I'll be downstairs cleaning the basement, and it'll pass by me so suddenly, I had actually thought I made it up. Then I'd be anywhere else in the house, and I'll just settle for a few minutes, and it'll pass by once again. This strange occurrence happened for several weeks. Then it progressed to random objects flying off the shelves at one point, and a cup almost hit me as I was walking past my bookshelf. Two months after the first incident, I started seeing a dark, shadowy silhouette in the basement just across from my room. Now I'm not one that scares easily, but after so many weeks of these incidents, I had increasingly become more and more paranoid, and so seeing it for the first time, I was so scared. I couldn't shut my door fast enough. It was like that every night, seeing it in the same spot. Soon enough, I began to see it all around my house, down the hallway, in the dining room, and despite being afraid, I tried to ignore it. Because if I didn't feed into what it wanted, it couldn't hurt me. Or so I thought. About two to three weeks after seeing it for the first time, I had woken up with a scabbing and scratching sensation down my back. Slight bruising as well. That was the only case of there ever being anything physical. Sometime after that, I had a dream involving the entity. In the dream, I was standing on the dock, watching the water, when I noticed a child standing at the end of it. The little boy fell in, and I had run to him, jumping in the water after him. But all I saw was the child being dragged under. Only its eyes were dark and hollow. It was like big pools of dark ink. Then as I'm trying to grab for him, I had this feeling of dread. Then I'm grabbed and faced with the same entity. Only this time I can actually see its face, pale and white, with the same black eyes like empty sockets, its face stuck in this silent scream. As I woke up, I had sleep paralysis and started going through some of the steps I have to do to get out of it. After that, the incident slowly died away, until finally I had a friend of mine cleanse the house and do a blessing. Ever since then, I haven't had any more occurrences. I'm just not sure how to make sense of all of this. My sister, age 12, recently came to me and described feeling uncomfortable in certain areas of the house, and said she'd been seeing the same dark silhouette of the same woman that I used to see. She also has been having nightmares of this entity watching her sleep and following her around. I still have not had any more experiences. I was wondering what anyone thought about why she's suddenly being affected after so long. 20 years ago, I was sleeping beside my husband and I woke up. As I was turning over, I look over at my husband's shoulder and saw a woman standing in the bedroom doorway staring at my husband, intently, with curiosity. She then began moving towards him. She had no idea I was watching her. When she began walking towards him, I got angry, and I was going to launch myself over him and tackle her, but she was too far away. I was concerned. I would wake my husband, and he would get up suddenly, causing me to hurt him. Instead, I turned over, got out of bed, and went around. But by the time I got to the end of the bed, she was gone. This was no common intruder. She was approximately five feet tall, very slim, but with a definite female figure, around a hundred pounds. She was not clothed, but looked like a solid silhouette, or as if head to toe in a skin-tight black bodysuit. She did not have hair on her silhouette. Why can I describe her so well? She was less than 12 feet away from me. And this was not the first time seeing the paranormal, so no shock or fear. But although I did not mind paranormal encounters, I do not let them come near my husband. Can anyone give any hints as to what she was? She seemed solid. I could not see through her or any details in the hall. She was darker than the surrounding night, but it might have been the moonlight, 
and we have skylights in the living room downstairs. When she realized I saw her, she stopped and felt surprised. I have also found info on shadow men, but this is a woman. Not a shadow, and not sinister. Does anyone know what this could possibly have been? I lived in Eastern Kentucky my whole life. I grew up way back in the holler. The last house on the road deep in the woods. I lived with my grandparents the majority of my childhood. And if I wasn't there, I was next door at my mum's house. Those woods have always given me a creepy feeling. I have felt stuff watch me. I have felt things touch me. I've seen stuff that I can't explain. When I lived with my grandparents, I would sleep with my mama. My papa slept in the other bedroom because they both snored really loudly and would keep each other up. My grandma's bed was right beside the window facing the woods. My side of the bed was right along next to the window. And in the summer, she would keep up the blinds and open the screen on the window and turn on the fan on high. Kentucky summers are extremely hot and humid. I remember many nights laying there and not being able to close my eyes because I would feel something watching me from the woods. I would lay there and stare into the darkness, hoping that I wouldn't see whatever it was and that it would go away. I would lay there for hours at a time. My whole family would see little small figures dart around the house across the hall from bedroom to bedroom. My mum has witnessed a lot in this house. One morning, my grandpa had taken my mama to work. She would go in at around 6.30 a.m. She never got her driving license, so my pup had always taken her to and from wherever she needed to go. My mum was getting ready for work that morning and thought papa had come home from town. She said, that was quick but he didn't reply. She said she heard him rustling through the cabinets like he does every morning, working on making coffee, and she said she even heard him spit in his spit bottle. My papa had chewed tobacco for as long as I can remember. She heard the recliner being opened and went into the living room, but no one was home. She left for work as soon as possible after that. Living in the double wide we had beside my grandma, I would sleep with my mum most of the time. The heat never circulated very well to the other side of the trailer for some reason, and in the winter it would get really cold. Her bed was facing the master closet and master bathroom, and my side of the bed faced the master bathroom. I can't tell you how many times I'd seen this, but I would see a woman sitting in the bathroom floor in the fetal position. She would be crying and would look up at me every now and then. I would tell my mum about it, but she would just tell me to go back to sleep. The nights I would sleep in my bedroom, I would see what looked like little trolls in my closet scampering around. I would shut the closet door, but by morning it would be ajar. That property the woods and land have something on it may it be an indian burial ground or whatever but being up there after dark now as an adult i still feel stuff watching me some stories my grandpa told me from the 50s he's the super religious type the type that if he's telling a story and he messes up one fact He'll soon correct it and say, Lord, forgive me. So I know for a fact these are the God's honest truth. My papa grew up in a one-room house here in the country, not too far from where I grew up. Him and his brother, my uncle, were around 15 or 16 and were sitting on the back porch of their house, just talking and laughing, probably drinking coffee. He swears on his life, that up in the sky, maybe 500 feet, a three-paneled door appeared, not in cloud form, but an actual door. He said the door was white and had a small lit lantern at the bottom of the door. He watched it for hours as it just sat there. They could see the flame flickering in the lantern, and after a few hours, it just completely disappeared. 
Another one he told me was about his dad, my great grandpa and his dad, my great great grandpa, fishing with another father and son one night on the North Fork of the Kentucky River. They did this about once a week around midnight. Not sure why midnight. Maybe better fishing. Anyway, they were heading back to town up river, and they started hearing a funeral hymn approaching. They stopped the boat on the river bank. And said that the boat was floating towards them with nothing but an old hickory casket in it. Sat there in amazement and scared to death, he said he could have reached out and touched it. That's how close it was. The other father and son said, "Well, I think that's sign for us to get home. I don't think they ever went fishing at night again." I've got several other stories that happened to me. And Eastern Kentucky certainly has a vast amount of paranormal activity, if you look in the right places. I'm a native of Long Island, New York, which, as you may know, has been settled for a long time, and has a lot of little old towns, especially on the eastern end of the island. We even have some Revolutionary War history. At the time of this story, I was seeing a guy from the local area, and one night he took me to a bar called the Checkmate Inn in Setiquet because some friends of his worked there, and it was supposed to be this cool old local spot with a few interesting stories. It used to be a private home and sits on a barely lit single lane road, winding through rows of tall trees. It actually still looks like an old house. And even has a cellar where they store the alcohol. Its second story has been converted into some apartments above the bar area, and staff sometimes rent them out. Across the street from the checkmate is the Thompson House, an old wooden structure built in 1709, belonging to a doctor during the Revolutionary War, and is now a museum of colonial medicine. We got there. Before the big rush of customers showed up, and we were able to talk with one of his buddies who tended the bar that evening. Somehow the subject of ghost stories came up. My date's buddy told me that he'd rented one of the upstairs apartments and had some weird experiences up there. There had been a few nights when he'd awoken at 3 a.m. to see a shadow standing on the opposite side of the bedroom, or being alone in the apartment at night. And hearing footsteps passing through the other rooms, having glass beer bottles suddenly slide off the kitchen table and crash to the floor, or witnessing his bedroom curtains waving wildly as if blown by a strong wind, only to find that the windows were closed and locked. One night he woke up in the darkness to see an old man leaning over his bed, looking furiously angry. Thinking someone had broken in, he yelled at the man. And sat up, but in that moment the man vanished. His brother had worked at the bar and rented one of the apartments before him as well, and reportedly saw not only the shadowy figure of an old man, but also what appeared to be a young woman in a pale dress in his bedroom at night. He never got a good look at her face, though. Apparently, the brother's girlfriend had stayed there with him overnight a few times, and had seen the woman as well. The bartender had worked at the checkmate for about a year at that time, and while he no longer rented the apartment there, he continued to have strange things happen to him while on the job. The most active part of the building was the old cellar. He said it's very dark and cool down there, and several times he'd gone down to grab another keg of beer or bottles of liquor, and had bottles flung at him when he was the only one down there. He'd also been pushed on the stairs while carrying bottles once. His co-workers also told stories of having an uneasy feeling in the cellar, and having kegs rolled across the room suddenly, or having bottles thrown at them. When they went to confront whoever was on shift with them at the time, they were always in another part of the building and denied playing jokes. He wasn't sure about the history of the house or whether anyone had passed away there, though. The home is from the mid 1800s, so I'm not sure if it had many overs through the years. While、well, I love ghost stories, and so did my date, 
We didn't find them so much scary as thought-provoking and entertaining. We enjoyed the rest of our night and went to leave at about 2.30 in the morning. Most of the patrons had left at that point, with just two or three stragglers hanging out on the back deck. We each had driven ourselves to the bar and I had parked on the side of the road, in front of the old Thompson house. We stood in front of the house talking for several minutes, and then shared a long kiss. Suddenly, both of us were startled by a very loud thump right next to us. We pulled apart and I started looking around for what could have made the noise. A few feet away, rolling towards the road, was a huge rock, almost the size of a cantaloupe. I was trying to be brave and picked it up. It must have weighed five or six pounds. I was pissed, thinking one of his friends at the bar had thrown it at us as an incredibly mean and unfunny joke. No one was around, and as we had been standing around for a while, we would have seen anybody crossing the road. The checkmate is set about a hundred yards from the road, and then off to the side is the patio. If someone had thrown it from across the street, they'd have to have been a shot put champ to hurl a six pound rock almost 200 yards. And even then, why was the rock bouncing quickly towards the road? None of the few remaining bar patrons had moved from their seats, and no one was up or moving around on the other side of the road. It looked as if it had been thrown from the direction of the dark woods surrounding the Thompson house. I walked around the property expecting to find someone hiding in the bushes, but I didn't see or hear anything. Neither of us had seen or heard anyone walking around. It was a still night on a quiet road, and unable to come up with an explanation, we were both pretty freaked out and decided that was our cue to leave. Something around there was clearly not happy with PDA. I'm no longer seeing the guy, as I haven't gone back there since. But one day, when the COVID lockdown is over, I'd like to go back and see if any of the current bar staff have any new stories to tell. Besides, it's a fun local bar and a good spot for a low-key night out. Next story. I now live in Northern Virginia. And as it so happens, the Gettysburg battlefield is only about an hour and a half drive away from where I currently reside. If you've ever heard the stories, the battlegrounds and the surrounding neighborhoods are supposed to be extremely haunted. They have some fantastic ghost tours there, and the town and battlefields have their own sort of aura about them. Even without hearing the stories, I went on a ghost tour one night with a friend of mine, at one point in the tour, we arrived at a creek on the edge of town. The story as told by our guide was that on the second day of the battle, a group of wounded Union soldiers had taken refuge in the creek bed, which was dry in the middle of summer. Many of them were badly injured and unable to move. Unfortunately, the summer storm came through and it began to rain heavily, flooding the creek bedding and drowning all of the wounded men. Not one of them survived, according to the tale. Well, it was night time when I stood there, and pitch black. I hung back as the tour group moved on to their next stop and looked around. There's a lot of long grasses and cattails growing along the creek now, and I decided just for the fun of it to take some pictures of them in the dark. I had flash on, and of course I made sure that there was no one in front of me or around me at the time. I really didn't expect anything, but figured why not? The next day, as I got home, I was looking through my tour photos, and in one of the pictures I had taken of the creek, you can see the reeds and cattails very clearly, lit up by the flash, floating above them, in the upper hand corner of the picture, dim but still very visible was a face. It was the side view of a man's face, and you could easily make out a blue cap from the front of a blue collared coat and yellow buttons. The forehead, eyes, nose, and parts of the chin, as well as what would appear to be dark hair under the cap, were very distinct. Remember again that this face is floating above the tall plants in the creek, and while not transparent, it does seem to be lit up by the flash. The two other photos I took of the same spot within seconds of each other had nothing on it. 
The blue military-looking coat and cap made me wonder if this could have been the apparition of a Union soldier, hanging around the spot where he'd tragically drowned. I showed the photo to a few people without pointing anything out to them, and every one of them immediately noticed the face. The third story here was told to me by a friend of mine who hails from Michigan. She was in a sorority during her undergrad years, and one of the sorority chapter houses had a ghostly legend attached to it. Apparently, a former sister had graduated and returned to the university years later as a professor. I'm not sure of the details, but her life was brutally ended in her home one night, and I don't think the killer was ever caught. Since then, the sorority house, where she had spent so much of her time of her life in, has been the site of disembodied footsteps, doors opening and closing, lamps turning on and off by themselves, and generally only when one of the sisters was alone in the house at night. She claims that many of the sisters she knew had experiences like this. One day, a visitor of one of the sorority's national councils came for a visit and stayed at the house. Not being from the local area, she decided to do some sightseeing in a nearby city, and brought her GPS with her. This was several years ago, before everyone had a GPS on their phones. She had kept the GPS in her room at the sorority house that day, and used it to navigate the city. On her way in, she experienced no problems and found her destination without difficulty. On her way home later that night. She plugged in the address to the house and soon noticed that her return route bore no resemblance to the one she'd taken earlier in the day. After many unfamiliar twists and turns, the GPS told her that she had arrived at her destination. The problem was she had not arrived at the sorority house, but a cemetery. After messing around with the device and re-entering the address, she finally found her way back to the sorority house. And explained to one of the hosts what had transpired. Upon revealing the name of the cemetery, she was informed that it just so happened to be the one that the murdered former sister was buried in. This story took place roughly thirty years ago. Me and my best friend Emma were rebellious teens. We were both fifteen and hated going to school. It just wasn't our scene. At the time, we lived fairly close to each other, and would often hang out at each other's houses. We'd sometimes even skip going to school and explore the local woods so that no adults could see us. It was on these excursions that we found the house of an old lady. Her name was Mrs. Bateman. We never got to meet her, but we saw her and said hello. That's about the extent of our conversation. Her house was in the middle of the woods, decrepit, practically falling to pieces, and she seemed absolutely insane, talking to herself while sitting in the garden on a chair that was surrounded by forest. It was an extremely odd place for a house, and we assumed that it must be because she owned the land, and were worried that we were potentially trespassing. But at fifteen. You'd think you're above the law, and everything else. Well, one day, we hear through some mutual friends, neighbors, and stuff that the lady, the crazy lady specifically, that lived in the woods, had passed away. The very next day, we're talking about it at school, and seeing as I really didn't want to do geography, me and Emma decide. To head up into the woods to see if we can see the house, maybe even the dead lady. Obviously, she'd been removed by this time, but we were teenagers and quite oblivious to how the world works. We started setting off. It was around two p.m. because we were skipping our final lesson. As we were walking through the forest, we knew no one would be none the wiser. This is where Emma started to pipe up. Saying she had a bad feeling about doing this, my only intention, of course, was to look at the house from the outside. I never really had any intention of going in, and just to see if I could see the body. There was this morbid fascination surrounding me. 
I wanted to know what happened to this woman and why she suddenly passed. What made people say she was crazy? And how did they know she was dead? I convinced Emma to carry on going, despite her relentless protests. It took us about 20 minutes of walking when we finally reached the house. There was no one there, which surprised me at first. As we approached the door, we looked through the windows, cautiously, scared that she might jump out at any moment despite people saying that she'd passed. There was no one in sight. That's when I got the guts to try the door. I slowly lowered my hand to the handle and started pulling down. At that very moment, it opened and I had a satisfying grin cover my face. Emma was scared. She dared not venture into someone's house without permission, but I, I did. I told her that we'd be quick. We'd just be exploring. No one was home. And the lady had passed away anyway. As far as we knew, she didn't have anyone to leave the house to or anything. So we were doing everyone a public service by seeing if there was anything worth taking. I know, I know, it was pretty crappy of me. Spoilers, I never actually took anything. In truth, I was just trying to entice Emma to go in. But that's neither here nor there. Anyway, continuing with the story. She followed me in because I wasn't going to stay outside. And looking up at the sky, it looked like it was going to rain. So I guess all of the reasons meant that she was going to come in. The house, as I mentioned before, wasn't in a very good state. She was a hoarder. There were newspapers piled up all around the place. The electricity was still working, but it was a dingy little place. We looked around the kitchen and it smelled disgusting. Clearly, she hadn't washed dishes in a long time. There was food waste accumulated on plates and stuff that was going moldy. She'd only been dead a few days, I thought. How could all of this have accumulated so quickly? In any case, we carried on looking around. The house didn't have a very welcoming atmosphere, but I just assumed I felt uncomfortable being on someone else's property when deep down I knew I really shouldn't be. We went up the stairs. The rooms were bare and barren, except her room, which had a whole host of trinkets on the little sideboard and table. Then we saw the last door at the end of the upstairs hallway. We tried to open it, but there was a small catch above us that appeared to have a lock. At that moment, Emma recalled that there was a tiny key which seemed to fit the lock over on the dresser in the other room. She went over, fetched it, and like a charm, it worked. We opened the door and were instantly hit with a wave of cold. We wondered if this was because this part of the house was in disrepair. But regardless, we took up the wooded stairs and started making our ascent. It's important to note that her house was carpeted, but these stairs were wooden, which gave it an extra creepy feel. There was no light switch as we were going up, so we were going up in full darkness nearly. By the time we reached the top, we tried using our hands to see if we could find any form of switch, when finally we found one, an old-fashioned one. We flipped it, and we were greeted by the darkness of the loft. There wasn't really much about. A few picture frames covered by a sheet, an old chair, nothing really of interest nor value. It was interesting to be up here. Having been in lofts before, I knew that you had to be careful, as there were lots of beams and wooden planks, and stepping in the wrong place could mean you fall through the ceiling, as it's not that stable. After we had a good look around, we were just about to leave when my friend Emma shrieked and ran downstairs. I asked her what was wrong, but she didn't reply. I looked around to the loft room and didn't see anything. And just as I was about to flip the switch and make my way down, did I look directly into one of the corners of the house. Near an area I hadn't really been paying attention to. There was a figure, a shadow. It almost looked like a man just standing in the corner, slightly crouched. 
All I could make out was the shape, no features. I stared at it. I blinked, and it was still there. At that point, I just about crapped my knickers and decided to run down the stairs, leaving the light switch on out of pure fear. Emma had already made it down the second set of stairs and was just about to leave the house, screaming at me to run out. I bolted, left the house, and we fled and went home. We were chilling at our house for a while, talking about what had gone on, hoping that my brother wouldn't overhear, as he had been at school, and we really didn't want him to know that we hadn't been there. After saying in whispers how freaked out we were, we both asked each other what we'd seen, and when we concurred it was the same shadow man, did our excitement fade to fear. We really hoped we hadn't disturbed something, and that's when we realised we never even closed the door. It was about 6pm at this point, and fairly dark. The forest and house weren't too far, but we really didn't want to go back. A part of me was worried someone may have seen us leaving that house, or that we might get in trouble. Now, the teenage stupidity had all but dissolved, and was left the real possibility that we could get in trouble for our stupidity. We knew we had to go back. No one closed the door. I even left the light on upstairs. What if people saw? What if people knew it was us? We gathered up our courage and a torch and started making our way back in the dark. The streetlights guided us most of the way and that's when we got to the entrance of the forest. We walked in with our torch to guide us. It wasn't the best, visibility was limited, but we made it to the house with the torchlight. When we arrived though, the door was closed, but the light was still on upstairs and was leaking through and could be seen from one of the top windows. Emma said she didn't want to go in, but went in anyway, as I knew it was my responsibility. She had the decency to wait at the bottom of the stairs, and said that if she heard me shout she was going to run, and she'd meet me in the forest as she had the torch. I flipped on the light switches, and started making my way up the stairs, hoping to hell I didn't see anything. My eyes were darting around the house, absolutely terrified, scared that at any moment this shadow man would appear out of nowhere and do who knows what to me. Every step was painful. And when I made it to the upstairs landing, I took a sigh of relief as there was nothing. That's when I saw the door. The door was closed. The upstairs door, I mean. The one that would take us to the loft. I had most certainly left it open, but perhaps in my haste, it had bounced back or something. Although it was open the whole time, I tried not to think about it. And I didn't want to make any noise. So I took off my shoes and started slowly creeping up the stairs. However, one of the wooden steps betrayed me, and it made a loud creak. I just about had a panic attack there and then, hoping that the entity wouldn't hear me. I was going up step by step. I could see the light switch. I was just about to flick it. And then I did. A wave of relief washed over me. As I crept down a little louder now, Content that I had done what I needed to do, I slipped on my shoes and started making my way downstairs. But when I got to the bottom, Emma was no longer there. Oh no, I thought. Where did she go? The door was closed and I never heard it open. Me being as quiet as possible, I doubt she would have left. So instead of opening the door, I looked out of the little square window in the door. But there was no light around. I walked out of where the stairway was, and into the living room, to see Emma, stood stock still, and terrified, staring into the kitchen area. I instantly saw what was scaring her. There was the shadow. It was now a lot more pronounced than before. The light leaking in from where we were, was meeting the darkness of the kitchen, but it was very clearly visible was radiating a dark and fearful aura. Maybe this is why the old woman went insane, I thought. And with that, I grabbed her hand, closed the door on our way out, and ran 
like I've never ran before. I don't think in all my life I've run any faster. This was Usain Bolt proud speed. We made it back to my house, sweating, panting, crying, and hugging at the end. We were so relieved and vowed not to get up to any mischief again regarding people's property we shouldn't be in in the first place. That's our story. We never saw the shadow man again or even approached that house. We stayed out of the woods for a long time. In a way, I think this experience helped us as we were too scared to even venture out of school and ended up passing all our grades reasonably well. But we both never forgot. Even though as we grew older, our friendship drifted apart. In my 50s, I actually moved back to the area and she had never left. A few years ago, we were talking at a bar and this event came up. We spoke of our memories and how terrifying it was and both could relate exactly the same thing to each other. I knew it was never just a story. It really happened. But God, it was the scariest moment of my life and really made me believe that there's something else out there. When I was 18, I moved into a first floor apartment with my best friend. The house is the last one on the street and it borders woods to the left side of it and a very large cemetery in the back. Literally the backyard was separated by a foot high rock wall that instantly turns into the tombstone area. Neither of us thought much of it when we moved in because we were 18 and didn't believe in ghosts. So the first month it started to feel strange. I don't know how to describe it, but I hated being there alone. And I was never that way before. I always felt that need to turn around and see if something was following me. Then strange things would happen. Tiny things turned up missing and would reappear in odd places. I once walked into my bedroom and found a pair of sunglasses centered on the floor of the room and my dog, this little chihuahua, and started barking and growling at nothing, maybe at a wall or something. It sounds like nothing, but he never acted that way before. It would scare the life out of me. I spoke to my friend, and turns out it's the same thing for her. It continues on like this for a while, until one day my friend calls me late at night and said that she'd been laying in bed trying to fall asleep when she started to think about a deceased family member and her vanity mirror light turned on, which had never ever happened before. It just popped on. So main creepy thing that happened to me. I was eating dinner one night in the kitchen area, which faced away from the living room and front door. I was watching Netflix on my iPad when out of nowhere, I felt ridiculously out of control, like my entire world had shifted. It was like this hysterical panic. After a few moments, my dog who was in the kitchen with me starts barking and growling at the front door area. He's going absolutely insane, and I'm still freaking out. I started bawling and calling my friend, asking her to come home. I then shut the door between the kitchen area and the living room with my dog in the kitchen with me. I'm not more than a minute into the phone call when I hear a huge crash in the living room. I never left the kitchen area and I continued to just cry on the phone until my friend and her boyfriend at the time got home. This didn't really change when they arrived. I was still extremely upset. After a bit, my friend tells me that the lamp, which had been on the shelf by the front door had been smashed into the middle of the room. The lamp was a hefty, Tiffany-style lamp that weighed a good amount and had been plugged into the wall. When I went out and looked, the lamp had moved at least three feet away and was smashed, as she stated, in the middle of the room. The next day, my mum brought over some sage and we just burnt it along the walls and rooms. Per Google, my friend and I kind of talked out loud to the ghosts. We assumed they were from the cemetery. We had emailed our landlord explaining the circumstances and told him we would be moving out. But immediately after that incident, things got better. 
It's so difficult to explain. I didn't feel alone per se, but I didn't feel any panic either. I didn't have that weird dread from before. We had a few incidents after that, which I won't go into. None of it made us feel unsafe. It just was acknowledgement that there was a hundred percent something paranormal going on. We lived there for four and a half years and I still miss that place. But when I tell my friend about it now, I can never fully explain that feeling that came over me that night. How abrupt and terrifying it was. I'm not an emotional person and nothing will ever come close to that again. This event occurred on the 29th of October, 2019. Between 6.23 and 6.27 AM, Eastern Time Zone of the USA. My daughter, who was nearly four at the time, had woken me up that Tuesday morning right before Halloween. I felt awake and perky that morning, so I grabbed my black glasses and put them on my face, got out of bed, then stood facing the wall which the door is located on, to slip my feet into the purple woolen slippers as I do each morning. This morning, however, was different. I had an extremely difficult time getting my slippers on, no matter how I moved my feet. The slippers moved millimeter by millimeter, and my feet chased them, unable to slip inside. It would have been comical how much trouble I was having, or it would have been had it not been slightly irritating and frustrating. However, determined I continue to slowly chase my slippers with my feet, as I check the time. The clock was by the door, and it illuminated that it was 6.24am. Meanwhile, I watched my daughter bound towards the door and despite my protests, she threw it open. Peering out into the dark hallway, I noticed something pure black, much darker than anything else, and began processing what this could possibly be. My dad had placed several items, a small bookcase and a lamp, as well as other stuff outside the bedroom door on the wall opposite my bedroom door and the bathroom door to the left of my room. So I assumed the blackness was some sort of office equipment. Yet I continued staring and an uncomfortable feeling began rising in my chest and stomach as I made out the shape of a nose on a head and I was viewing this at an angle rather than head on. My slippers were still not cooperating either, as I had the sudden thought, oh God, is that a shadow person? I chided myself, rolled my eyes and laughed internally, thinking I've been watching too many paranormal shows on the travel channel, or perhaps too much Mortis Media. But at that moment, my discomfort and sense of alarm grew as I noticed that my daughter had not moved once she threw the door open. My eyes widened as I wondered, does she see it too? Looking back and forth between the blackness and my daughter, I suddenly realized that it could lift its arm and touch her. Frantically, I tried to get my feet into the slippers, but it was as if my foot and the slippers were opposing poles of a magnet. I literally could not get my foot inside for some reason that I can't explain either. I had it in my head that I had to get my slippers on before moving to the other side of the room, so I continued to struggle with my stupid slippers watching the darkness and my daughter stare at each other. Great parenting, I know, but I think the shadow person had a hand in it. By now, the time was 6.26. Suddenly, an idea popped into my head. I called my daughter over. Baby, come here, please. And for once she obeyed, as the spell was broken. My slippers suddenly allowed my feet into them. And let me tell you, I had felt incredibly clumsy being able to put on a pair of slippers. By the time my daughter had walked the mere three meters to my side, I gave her a hug and looked up. And she nonchalantly said, I saw a shadow. It felt as if all my internal organs dropped to the floor. Gasping, I stared at the door. The blackness was gone. It was 6.27 a.m. Where the blackness had been, there was just a lump with a white lampshade and a desk or bookshelf in a blonde shade of wood. Nothing could have possibly had the appearance of a jet black silhouette. Fast forward to yesterday, 
Thursday, May 14th, around 4 p.m. I walked down the same hallway, but when I stepped in front of the bathroom door, which was closed, did I see the light pop on and hear the fan start, as they're on a single motion sensor switch. Again, the door was closed, so it would be impossible for it to pick up any movement outside the bathroom. Just to be sure, I knocked, opened the door and peered inside. It was completely empty. Now this one I could have rationalized away, except the timing seemed so deliberate, as it was only about a meter from where my daughter and I had seen the shadow person more than six months before. A shiver ran up my spine as the memory came back to me. Every time I had to walk past that spot, since seeing the shadow person, I've been afraid. And I think the bathroom light was a bit of a reminder that he is still there. I live in Ottawa, Ontario, and work for myself as a residential HVAC installer. One winter in the late 2000s, I had a job in the downtown area, reconfiguring some ductwork in a very large three-story house that was undergoing a full renovation. I estimate the job to be about a day's work and schedule accordingly. The day of that job, however, I overslept and showed up late in the morning. The contractor who hired me greeted me with a sarcastic good afternoon in reference to my late arrival. The house had pretty much been gutted down to the studs, and there were several tradesmen working in various parts of the house. My work was on the second floor, so I made a few trips to bring all my tools from the van and got to work. As is often the case, the work turned out to be more involved than I had expected, so I knew I had to work fast or I was going to be there all night. I became very focused on my work, and after a while noticed the lights go out, as one of the work crews, maybe the plumbers, were leaving. They said something about there only being one extension cord I could use for power, as there were no outlets anywhere. I absentmindedly thanked them, but stayed focused on the work, relying on the natural light spilling in through the windows. At some point later on, I noticed the natural light was getting dim. So I started thinking I would need to get out my trouble light soon. A little while after that, I noticed it seemed to be a little quiet. So I stopped working and looked around. I couldn't see anyone or hear any voices, but I had the distinct feeling that there was still someone around. The time had come to plug in my trouble light. So I went over to where the extension cord was and plugged in. Then I listened for noises downstairs, but heard nothing. I checked the time on my phone, and it was after 5pm. I walked up to a window at the front of the house and looked down at the big laneway, which seemed very far down from this towering house. Aside from my van, it was empty. Being wintertime, it was now pretty much dark out. It was one of those dreary, cloudy winter evenings. Wind was blowing a light dusting of snow in the front of the streetlights. There wasn't anyone to be seen on the street. In that moment of realization that I was alone in the house, that feeling I had of someone being around instantly intensified into a very strong feeling that someone was definitely on the second floor, watching me through the bare studded walls. The hair stood up on the back of my neck and arms, and I turned around and saw no one. I had one trouble light lighting the floor with all my tools spread all over the place. I had about an hour and a half left of work to do. And I often work by myself in empty houses and in the evenings. And I'm a large guy that doesn't scare easily. The bottom line was despite that feeling of being watched, I had to put on my big boy pants, so to speak, to get the job done. I've never put duck work together faster in my life. I just tried to block out my emotions on work. As I worked, and as the night got darker around me, that presence intensified. It definitely felt malevolent, and after a while it seemed to be coming from every direction, especially the stairs leading to the third floor. It seemed quite angry that I was here. I was afraid to focus my attention on anything around me for fear of actually seeing or hearing something to go with that presence. 
To have to finish my work and clean up my tools under that angry, oppressive presence was horrible. By the time I packed up, then started bringing my tools downstairs, it almost felt like it was chasing me out of the house. The last thing I had to do, and the hardest, was to make that last trip back up to get my final load of tools. Before I pulled out of the parking lot, I looked up at the house and it seemed to be glaring at me. I've had paranormal encounters before, and I couldn't discern whether this was just demonic in nature or a very angry ghost. I remember thinking as I drove away, God help whomever was moving into that house. And in future, I should try to avoid sleeping late. This story happened to me all throughout my life. In any case, let's jump to the first experience. My mum had just gotten to me into Michael Jackson back in 2003, when she got me his number one hit records. I had a six CD stereo with a remote in my room, and I fell asleep listening to the music. One night I was listening and Thriller was on. This had the Vincent Price ending, and at the end of the song, a door squeaks when it's closing. My closet was almost an entire wall, and it was two side doors. Well, the song ended, and I saw one of my closet doors push out and close, making a similar song. I ran downstairs and told my mum and her ex. They assured me it was my mind just playing tricks on me. They walked up to my room with me, checked the closet to put me back in bed. A few months later, I was laying in bed trying to get to sleep. I used to keep my bedroom door open from the light in the bathroom. But my mum and her ex got me a lava lamp, since they were trying to lower the light bill. It's around half midnight, a school night, my lava lamp is on, my stereo is playing a local radio station at a low volume, and I'm staring at my door as I try to drift off to sleep. I saw a figure walk through my door. She had a pink aura. It wasn't bright, but I knew it was a lady, and she was a bit on the heftier side and I could tell from her facial features that she was middle-aged and dark-skinned. She was walking towards me, slowly, and I was frozen in fear. So I put the blankets over my head and kept them there for the rest of the night. I fell asleep at one point, waking up to my alarm clock. I never told my mum or boyfriend about this experience, and I was very reluctant to tell my mum's boyfriend because he always comes off as one to chalk things up to being my imagination. My second experience was quite a while later. I was 18. I was in my room watching Step Brothers when I hear a slight knock. I had no idea if it was coming from the movie or not, and I thought it could have been my sister or mum wanting to come in and talk to me. I rewinded the movie and heard no knock, so I opened my door and saw the ghost again. She was at the bottom of the steps and was turning the corner to go downstairs. I wasn't scared for at this point, I had been really into the paranormal and she meant no harm. Or so I thought. A few months after this, my friend came over and we were in my room talking about the paranormal. When the topic of ghosts comes up, I tell her my experiences and start stupidly mocking the ghost I had seen twice. I say she won't come out and show herself, and that she's too scared to do so. My friend leaves and I go to bed at some point, and wake up the next day with scratches that start from my right ankle around my leg twice, and up to my inner thigh. My leg was really sore. The line was perfectly intact, and there's no way I could have done it in my sleep. I pondered on what it could have been, and I can vividly remember looking around my room and saying, I'm sorry for mocking you. I won't do it again. Those three experiences are pretty far apart, but between them I've had some unexplained stuff happen. Our house phone illuminates at night, and at one point the upstairs bathroom toilet didn't flush. Walking down the steps and into the kitchen, then downstairs to use the bathroom, I can look to see the time on the phone as I'm walking into the bathroom. I can remember it was between 3.30 and 3.45. I was in the bathroom for a while, and when I walk out I go check the time on the phone. But it wasn't on the charger. It was about seven feet away on the table. 
I could chalk it up to my mom or her ex because they slept in the living room, but they rarely ever woke up in the middle of the night. And even so, why grab the phone so late? The TV was off and I'd hear them if they were up. I've heard steps in the downstairs room, the tables and chairs not being in the same place just seconds after seeing them in another spot. I even had my first and only episode of sleep paralysis, which was nothing too horrifying, just unable to move, breathe and open my eyes for 15 seconds. Nothing scary. We had two dogs and one stayed inside and one stayed outside and in the garage. And there were times when the inside bomb would stop what he was doing and just stare at a wall or corner. Sometimes he'd bark, and other times he'd give off a low growl. My mum worked at a college for a long time, and there was a foreign exchange student from the UK. We became very close. We'd often stay together, and my mum's ex and the student and I were watching The Exorcist and got to talking about stuff. By this time, I didn't care what my mum's ex thought of my experiences, and I told them the things that had happened. As I'm explaining, I don't go into the details of the ghost outside and how she had a pink aura, and my mum's ex kept asking if it was a dark lady on the heavier side. At one point, I told him it was, and finished my story. When I was done, I told him that he probably didn't believe me, and he said he did. What he said next, though, sent chills down my spine. He said he was good friends with the former house owner. He got it way before we moved in. And the former house owner died in the living room after having a heart attack. He purchased the house soon after her untimely death and told me her name was Ernestine. And she had pink curtains, pink rug, and her favorite color was pink. I never doubted or put my experiences off to my imagination because I've had some odd things happen at my grandma's house before we moved in with my mom's ex. But this sold me that the house was being watched over by her and she'd taken a liking to me, despite me mocking her that one time. This happened a little over two years ago and I still think about it from time to time. It was October and I was a senior in high school at the time and had been sleeping in very late, as I had a terrible case of senioritis. When I woke up, my mother had just returned home, and I said my typical morning greeting to her in the kitchen. She had seemed somewhat surprised when she saw me, and eventually told me something rather alarming. About 30 minutes before I had awoken, she had seen my younger brother getting ready for school, as she had passed by the archway into the living room, she said she saw me standing next to the couch. She assumed I was waking up and groggy. She hadn't thought much of it and continued on her task of taking my brother to school. The rather alarming part is that not only had I still been sound asleep in my room, but she told me that I had been wearing a gray t-shirt with a specific design on it. At the time, I no longer owned that specific grey t-shirt. I'm not even sure where it went. I was also wearing a completely different t-shirt when I woke up. She said that I had just been standing there with my long dark hair obscuring my face. This chilled me to the bone, as one can only imagine. I got over it pretty quickly though, in the dismissive way a high school senior often does. But I still think about it from time to time. My parents' house has always been rather creepy. I had a few more odd experiences up until I moved out and into an apartment with my fiance, then boyfriend. On a few occasions, I've heard my name being called by my father when I was home alone. A pretty creepy encounter happened a few months after my mum had seen my imposter. I had been putting my shoes on in the dining area as I looked up and I saw a greyish figure float by the window. It had gone by the first window and didn't continue into view of the second window. It completely vanished. It was broad daylight, as I had gotten a pretty good view of it, even though it had gone by rather fast. It seemed to be wearing a cloak or a cloak-like grey hoodie. I remember grabbing my bag and running outside, heading down and leaving for school like a bat out of hell. 
My mother had also reported seeing orbs of light shooting across the ceiling on occasion, and hearing the occasional voice or two call her name, one of them being a child's voice. My parents' dog would sometimes whine at a specific wall in the living room, before backing up and running down the hallway like he's terrified. This is alarming because he's a big, a hundred pound dog. Even my fiance has experienced a few things. The creepiest by far being the sight of the same possible shadow person I had seen. This was right after I graduated. We'd been cuddling on my bed. I had my face against his chest and my back to the bedroom door. All of a sudden, he stiffened and said, "Whoa!" He said he saw something zip by the open doorway. It was almost as tall as the door, dark in colour, and seemed to be gliding. It also looked to be wearing a cloak of some kind. This is just an estimate, but the door is seven to eight feet tall. When he told me this, I immediately thought of the dark, seemingly cloaked figure that I had seen a few months before that. He had also been scratched once by seemingly nothing. Something of these experiences are rather run-of-the-mill haunted house stuff. Others stand out and are more unnerving. The only people who haven't felt, seen, or heard anything odd are my father and brother. This has come to my mind once again, because a few weeks ago my parents had gone out of town, and I had stopped by to bring in their mail and borrow their vacuum, as mine had broken. As I walked through the house to grab the vacuum, a very sudden feeling of uneasiness fell over me. I felt the overwhelming feeling that something was nearby and watching me. I'm not gonna lie; I grabbed that vacuum and booked it out of there. I hardly wanted to lock the place up. Here's the thing: I have always been interested in the paranormal, but this all stumps me. I sometimes wonder if some of the events may have been caused by me. I had played with a Ouija board a few times with a friend when I was 15. There is also an abandoned house about a mile from my parents' home. Keep in mind, this is in the middle of the country, long dirt roads and cornfields going nowhere. We'd walked there multiple times and taken pictures on the inside, with broken mirrors, pentagrams drawn on the walls, broken beer bottles, and totally unfinished walls and everything. We even found a child's shoe on this side of the house, and the skulls of some animals in the barn. We were creeped out. On one occasion, my friend Ali had turned and yelled, "I ghosts, we love you!" Stupid, right? This messed up part is immediately after that. We heard a loud scream from the property of the house. It sounded almost like an animal. Needless to say, we didn't return after that experience. Weirdly enough, any time I opened my photos app to show other people the pictures we took. The app would crash, and my phone would sometimes even die at full battery. Never had an issue with that phone. Afterwards, there were a few times Ali would stay the night, and I'd be pinched, seemingly out of nowhere, and she'd feel her hair be pulled. This stopped after a month or so. Bad choices aside, I've researched all of this as much as I can, and feel maybe it's time to get an outsider's opinion. I'm sharing this in the hope that someone might be able to get answers in regard to these odd happenings. More specifically, the ghost who stole my face and the mysterious cloaked shadow person. I'm also wondering why only myself, my mother, and my fiance have experienced these things. Perhaps we're more perceptive. My brother and father are skeptical. They don't buy into the paranormal at all. My fiance is very skeptical too, and yet he's experienced these things and has never found an answer for them. He's experienced a few other rather messed up paranormal things in his childhood that he can't explain, but that's a story for another day. The creepiest thing I found suggested his scratches, the three long superficial slashes down his back. They could have been of demonic origin, which terrifies me. If anyone has any ideas. Please let me know. I could really use with some help. My whole life, my mother has told me snippets from her childhood, from what I've learned from her, my father, and eavesdropping on family conversations. My mother had a 
terrible childhood. My grandfather was an abusive junkie who left her home alone for days at a time. It wasn't until she was 17 she was able to escape. In her mid-twenties, she met my father and they got married. They tried for years to have children, but had been told they would never be able to. Then on March 26th, 2001, my grandmother had an overdose in what is now my parents' bedroom. We don't know if it was accidental or purposeful, but they believe it was an accident. The next day, the 27th, was the date put on her death certificate. Exactly one year later, my parents had their first child, me. Growing up, I didn't know anything about my grandmother besides her name. That is until one day I was in the fourth grade, going through our home library. I come across a book and am instantly drawn to it. The book is a law book. I liked books so much that I took it to school the next day to read. That is when I decided I wanted to become a lawyer. And I plan on starting college next year to pursue that dream. The reason I'm telling you this is because I would find out later that the book had belonged to my grandmother. And at one point in time, she herself had been in law school, but never graduated. There's always been small coincidences such as these that have made me feel connected to her, as if she was still here now. This is where things begin to get weird. For as long as I can remember, I hear things at night in the attic and walls. The obvious answer would be animals, but I've heard animal sounds in the attic before. Scratching, scampering, squeaking, but that's not what I hear. It's thuds, heavy things being moved about. High heels was very common when I was younger. My sister and I have bedrooms on one side of the house and my parents on the other. For years, my sister and I have been complaining about these noises, but my parents have never been able to find anything or hear anything themselves. Everything I've told you so far is interesting, but I didn't consider it enough to share. But things have been getting weirder lately, and I've become genuinely concerned. Personally, I've always believed in spirits, and that there may be one in this house. But I never had anything besides noises and feelings to back it up. That is until a few weeks ago. I was having a bad day. So bad, in fact, I was sitting on my bed sobbing. This may seem dramatic, but I felt the need to open my arms wide and release my emotions. And that was the first time it happened. I heard something, and I looked up. The cords on my fan were swinging back and forth rapidly. My fan wasn't on, and my arms weren't long enough to reach the cords. I even tried to stretch and touch them from where I was sitting, but I was at least two to three feet away from even being close. Now to the reason I'm sharing this. About half hour ago, I'm sitting on my bed watching a show when I heard a noise. I look up and only one of the cords was moving and fast. My fan wasn't on. I put my hands around the cords to feel if maybe air had done that, although it doesn't explain how only one would be moving without the others being affected. I'm honestly very freaked out and would appreciate any thoughts and suggestions. My family has always been pretty sensitive to the paranormal, only on my mother's side, but it did pass down to my brother and myself. The first story occurred when I was about six years old. I have a friend called Caitlin. We hung out almost every day. I live in a wooded area and we have a brush pile of approximately seven feet. Caitlin came over one day in the middle of winter and we were sledding down the snowbanks in my driveway. We were about to go on our third or fourth run to solidify the track and Caitlin froze in her step. I jokingly asked her if she was tired already, and she smacked me and pointed to the brush pile. Do you see that? She asked me. I turned and saw a figure there. It stood a foot or so above the brush pile, making this thing about eight feet tall. It was in the shape of a person, but a solid black mass. Needless to say, we both freaked out because it was just standing there. 
and as we ran towards the house, it disappeared. Fast forward eight years. I'd just turned 14 and we temporarily moved in with my grandparents. I was down in the basement doing some artwork for an assignment and I felt like I was being watched. I turned around and I remember dropping my paint palette on the ground. There it was. This thing that I hadn't seen in so long was standing in front of me. I had no idea where it came from and at this point had chalked the previous experience up to being a child with an overactive imagination. But here it was standing in front of my face. I noped out of the basement as fast as I could and started seeing it more frequently every time I went to do the cat litter, which sadly was also in the basement. Every time I was down there painting, and even when I was at school this thing would appear. I was convinced I was going mad. I ended up calling Caitlin and asked her if she remembered anything odd from when we were kids. She responded with something along the lines of, not really besides the thing in the brush. Now I knew something weird was happening. She remembered the experience as vividly as I do, even though we hadn't spoken about it in almost a decade. I'd recently moved into my new house and figured that would be the end of it. But nope. First night I was in the basement, the figure was back. I still see it to this day over 10 years later. I have no idea what it is. There's so much more to tell with this entity, including a near-death experience. I just wanted to put this out there to see if anyone knew what it is. Some members of my family built a house in the country back in the early 90s. Strangely, there had historically been houses previously there which had burned down. I don't know if anyone passed in either, but I have my suspicions. As they were building the house, a neighbor approached and plainly told them that their house was going to burn down. It was the first thing anyone ever said to them about their house. The house still does exist and they still live there, but there have always been some weird happenings in the house. The mother was studying for a college test and heard a ball bouncing against the wall in one of the children's rooms. She called for the child to stop throwing the ball, forgetting that they were at school. As she did so, the ball rolled down the bedroom hallway towards the living room and into her line of sight. She was alone in the house. The boy and I were once in his basement room and we saw the face of something human-like, but completely dull and lifeless in the storm window, the little 18-inch tall window at the ceiling in some basement rooms. There's no way the face could have been there because the storm window was only 18 inches deep and the face was oriented normally. Sleeping in this house is like a real nightmare. As a child, I would feel things brushing my arms and legs when I slept. There was this awful Mrs. Beasley doll that the mother had that I swear would follow you with its head as you walked around. A few weeks ago, I was staying with my mum, grandfather and uncle in a small cottage in Cape Cod, probably built sometime in the late 60s. My mother and I were staying in a room with two twin beds about six feet apart on each side of a small room. We had driven there late and everyone was settling down to go to bed around 3 a.m. The very first night that we were there, it was around 3.30 and the lights were off and my mum was already asleep. Now I 100% know that I was tired at this moment, but I was completely awake. I'm getting chills just thinking about it. I was laying on my side in the direction of the bed facing my mother, and suddenly I blinked, and the next thing I know, a pitch black shadowy figure with womanly features and long hair hanging down appeared in front of me, clear as day and whispers, hey, shh. And for a short moment, I thought it was my mum. But when I looked, she was asleep and the figure was gone before I could react. I spent the next two hours freaking out, practically having an anxiety attack with my heart racing, trying to play off what I just saw. My mother doesn't believe in the supernatural and says it was my imagination. But I am a college age man I know for a fact that I was completely awake when I saw and heard what I did. I felt incredibly uncomfortable in the room the next three nights. 
as we were there and slept facing the wall. I didn't even dare to flip over and face that wall again, and I swear I heard light footsteps the next few nights in that room, all aboard the nope train. I grew up in a haunted house, and never really liked talking about it. The house had a bit of a messy history as well, but I'm not sure if that really ever played a part. Not the stuff I'm aware of anyway. When I grew up, my brother and I talked about it, and it turns out he'd experienced things as well, though I never went into any details of my own. The part people seem most interested in are the three specific things that I encountered frequently. So that's what I'm going to focus on. The first is the boy. There was a young boy of maybe nine, perhaps even a little younger, who stayed in my room. I wasn't even aware of him until I moved from my brother's room to my own. He never spoke and always seemed really scared. He hid in different places in my room, under the bed, in the closet, in corners, even once or twice in the upper corner of the room against the ceiling. Sometimes suggested he may be scared of the other two, but I didn't know if he was even aware of the old woman, who was the only other one that came into my room. I don't know for sure, I guess. I don't know anything for sure. But to be fair, whatever the case, I recall that he had shortish but messy brown hair and wore red, white and blue striped rugby style shirt. I believe he was aware of me. He mostly kept to himself, but he would stare at me sometimes and would open and close my closet and this little armory in my room. But most of the time, if I didn't see him, I wouldn't even know that he was there. The old lady. She was not confined to my room, but I rarely saw her anywhere else. Like I said, she used to wake me up, staring at me face to face, almost nose to nose. She had huge eyes. I remember that vividly. Whenever I would see her, she would usually be staring at me. I always had this feeling that when she was in my face at night, she was checking on me to see if I was breathing. I really don't know why I got that feeling. She was mostly not frightening, but she scared me once or twice pretty badly. Once was at night. I was maybe 10 to 11. She woke me up right in my face. The problem was I was already having a pretty bad nightmare. I pretty much only have nightmares and stress dreams, and I screamed. I don't know if that scared her or annoyed her, but she shrieked and sort of scuttled away. That was the worst one. Other times, she mainly just creeps me out. She likes to hum these weird sounding songs and basically looks like an old lady. Floral print dress and stockings. The eyes were pretty creepy as well, though, I suppose. Next, the bad one. This is the only one I genuinely feared. It never touched or hurt me, except when I would fall or stub a toe while fleeing. Sometimes it felt like a woman, but other times it didn't feel like a specific gender. It liked to chase me, especially up the stairs. When it did that, it was a woman with very stringy and greasy hair, and it either didn't have a jaw or its jaw was unhinged, with something disgusting slobbering from the mouth. Its tongue hung from its mouth almost to the floor, and it was wearing something very bulky. The best I can describe it is that it seemed to be wearing a guile suit. It had fringes and was dark, seemed dirty as well. I'm not even sure if it was clothing or being worn. The strangest part of this one is that I never saw it like I did the others. I just sort of felt it and always had a vivid mental image. It didn't always look like a woman thing. Sometimes I didn't get an image, only a feeling. She used to scream as I turned the hall corner too, just to jump scare me, it seemed. It was a real a-hole, even though it never touched me. I always got the feeling that it hated me. Like if it had the ability to, it would have hurt me. I would talk about it more. But as a grown man, I've got knots in my tummy just thinking about it. I often doubt if I even believe my own experiences. 
I have been plagued with nightmares for so long, but I never rule out dreams. But it doesn't cover all of it. I'm a very logical person and always play the skeptic when I discuss the paranormal with friends. I think this is part of the reason I don't share this stuff often. Maybe only with three other people and never in so much detail. So believe what you want. I may not even believe in it sometimes and still want to tell myself that it's all just a dream. When I was a kid, probably between eight and 10, I used to see shadow people in the night. It happened almost every single night. It was so frequent that I just got used to them. They never scared me when I saw them. They would just walk against the wall and watch me while I was in bed. I remember they never had clothes, they were just a figure or body. They used to open my door at night, and I'm pretty sure one of them whispered my name into my ear at night, before bed, while I was brushing my teeth. I was in the washroom with my cousin and sister brushing our teeth before bed. They finished before me, and I was alone upstairs and I could feel something behind me but didn't acknowledge it until I heard a really faint whisper of someone saying my name right into my ear. All I remember is freaking out and running downstairs screaming that someone just said my name. There was also this one time I was playing hide and seek with three of my siblings and after finding two of them, we were looking for my sister and toys started being flung from her room. Being kids, we laughed it off, went running into the room looking for her, but there wasn't anyone there and we ended up finding her hiding in the basement. I also remember I used to suffer from two different night terrors when we lived in that house. One of them I still can't explain to this day. I can only draw a picture, but it's hard for me to do because of how traumatizing it was. The other was a dream of me walking down the basement and finding a little girl curled up in a ball in a box crying. The strange thing about that second dream is that my younger brother had the exact same dream. He's 17, I'm 23, and we still agree that's some messed up stuff going on in the house. This all started when I was living in military housing. I was between 11 to 13. My brother and I slept in the same room because I was scared to sleep by myself at the time. I would sleep on a futon by the door and he would sleep on his bed in the back corner. During the time living there, he would tell me that when he went to sleep, he would wake up not being able to move and would see a shadow figure just standing there or moving around watching him. But I didn't think it was anything because he has sleep paralysis every now and then. One night I was sleeping over at a friend's house and when I came back the next day, we were in a Skype call playing Team Fortress 2. He told me that night when I was sleeping over at a friend's, he heard my mom, dad and myself call him when he was showering. Still, I didn't put too much thought into it. After a while, my father's friend wanted to take care of his two dogs for a month as he was going on a vacation. During that time, it was summer. So my whole family's sleep schedule was ruined one night by my brother, father and mother as they were walking the dogs around the block. And I was in my brother's room playing BO2 zombies when suddenly the door started to open slowly. It's like those paranormal videos online when they slowly open. I thought it was the wind at first, so I closed the door and locked it. When I went back to the game and it opened again and unlocked, I was freaked out at this point and closed the door and made sure to hear it click to guarantee myself it had indeed been closed all the way. I locked it and gave it a pull. It didn't open. So again, I decided to sit down and resume playing. And when I looked back, I think whatever it was was probably angry. And not long after, the door burst open like someone had kicked it open. And I just felt like there was a demon or a monster coming to kill me. So I ran downstairs out of the house to the neighbors in the middle of the night ringing their doorbell, but no one answered. And I started crying in the middle of the street until my family returned from their walk. 
My mother got tired of us talking about this thing and called my grandma, who's very religious and spoke in a completely different language that no one understand while deep in prayer. And she goes to other people's homes to cleanse them. My mum told her everything, so my grandma went on a twenty-day fast with only water. And when she was ready, which was when we were back in school, she told them to take us to school and come back, and to call her. I honestly didn't know that she knew much, but when they were on the phone, she said to go to the kids' closet and that it's in there. So my mom opened it and started to pray out loud with my grandma on speaker, telling it to go away. Then she says it went downstairs to the kitchen corner, and she tells my mom to open the door and let it out. She does just that, and it's gone. And we haven't had an experience like that again. Years later, I asked her about it, and she told me the whole story, and it was actually there much earlier than I thought. I don't even remember, but my brother and I would say we don't like eating at the kitchen table because there's a guy in the corner staring at us. And just before everything, there was a whole flock of crows flying above our house in circles. That day, that she opened the door and let it out, she could hear a squeal like an animal or a pig, and again the crows were back, but this time they were flying away. My grandma said it was the spirit of death wanting to take one of us and to destroy the family. So crazy to me. Also, throughout that whole time, my dad got cancer. My mom was suicidal and had a knife on her throat in front of us, and they were going to get divorced. My dad was discharged for the navy for sleepwalking and taking something from a store at the barracks. Eventually, everything got better. Now I'm a junior in high school, and so grateful to my grandma for helping out. I was sleeping pretty tight, and I think it was something like two to three p.m. You know, when inside your house is totally dark, but not that pitch black darkness, more like a bluish darkness. Anyway, I was sleeping like a rock. Trust me, because I woke up all of a sudden without the sound waking me up. And the door of this room was open. I can clearly see the short corridor and part of the living room. And then I looked to the living room to see something tall, a hundred percent black, and wearing something like a coat, standing near my boyfriend's grandma's feet. And I was paralyzed. I stared at the entity for a minute or so, and it wasn't even bothered that I was looking. I looked to my boyfriend's bed, but he was asleep. And I wanted so badly to wake him up, but I was scared that if I moved, I would rouse the thing and it would approach me. Maybe if I stand up or stick my leg pretty close to his, I'll wake him. I thought, but I was afraid the entity would look my way. So I tried pressing my eyes together to see if it was a hallucination, but it didn't vanish. It was standing there like a real person. So after deciding that I couldn't do anything about it, I closed my eyes with my heart pounding on my chest and fell asleep. In the morning, I heard from my mother-in-law that his grandma wasn't feeling well and had to go to the hospital. I can't say how freaked out I was, but I didn't tell her because she's skeptic. But I told my boyfriend what happened, and from that day on, I've always been afraid to wake up in the middle of the night in case I see something I don't want to. I live in North Carolina, in a once small county. I moved to the United States from Mexico in 2008, and moved into a really small, cramped house that had two bedrooms and a bathroom, a kitchen, and living room. Well, we pretty much started from zero, since we'd only just arrived to the U.S. It was me and my mum and dad and five other siblings, three brothers and two sisters. I was the youngest. We didn't have much. My three brothers and I shared a room while my parents and two sisters stayed in another room. One night I had to go to the toilet, so I got up and went to the bathroom. The bathroom was next to my parents' room. I heard something fall when I was in mid piss. I thought nothing of it, since I had a lot of siblings and simply assumed it was one of them. 
After I was finished with my business, I washed my hands and decided to check who made that noise. As I walked into the room, I saw my sister was awake and looking in the corner of the wall, like if someone was staring back at her. I thought it was so weird. So I asked what she was doing. She didn't answer me. And so I said, Hey, I'm talking to you. Then she snapped out of her mind and looked at me with a really scared face. I was going to ask what happened. And then she started screaming for my mum. I got scared and jumped to my parents bed. They woke up and asked what was going on. I said I didn't know. They told me to return to bed. After I'd left the room and stayed outside the door to listen to what they were talking about. I could hear my sister crying and telling my parents she saw a woman in a black dress. She said the woman was standing besides two children who looked to be burnt. My parents told her it was just a dream and to go back to sleep. But she said that she wasn't sleeping when it happened. It was at that precise moment my parents looked at each other with fear painted on their faces. To try and appease her, they told my sister to lay down with them. So she did. I went to bed after, and a few days later my sister began screaming again. She woke up everyone in the house claiming the lady was trying to grab her. All my siblings were confused. What woman? They asked. She said she saw the same woman from before. But this time, she had tried to grab her. She said that she had woken up to use the bathroom when she saw the children on the opposite corner. Then the lady came from the hallway. She screamed as she approached her, but she wasn't walking. She was floating. As her hand was approaching my sister, all three of them suddenly vanished. My parents told her that she needed to stop making stuff up, but my sister insisted. She was telling the truth. My mother at that point got very nervous and scared because reading my sister's facial expressions, she could tell it wasn't a lie. She then told her to sleep with them. And the next day, my mother called a local priest to bless the house. After that, the activity went down and my sister didn't see the lady anymore. Well, one day, a pipe under the house broke. So my dad had to go into the crawl space to replace the pipe. He told all of my brothers to go down there with him to help. So we all followed. What we found still haunts me to this day. As soon as I stepped into the crawl space, I got a chill. I saw a lot of candles all over the place. They were red and they were black. I asked my dad why they were here. He replied saying they were probably just old candles that people didn't need. My brother called my dad and told him that he found a lot of books. My father said that that was nice and to take him outside to see what kind of books they were. So my dad fixed up the pipe and left the crawl space. At that point, my brother comes up to him and asks him what are all the drawings on the book? takes a look at the books and sees what can only be described as rituals. He then tells us to drop the books and go inside to get my mother. At that point, they talk about it. And I think they confirm that they were wicked, perhaps even demonic or witchcraft books. My mum then tells him to gather them up and set them on fire, which he does by pouring gasoline all over them. At that point, they start wondering if it's related perhaps in any way to what my sister had been seeing. We try to put it to the back of our minds though, go in and eat dinner, and then watch TV. But that same night, we hear my sister screaming. I hear my parents tell her what was going on. And she said the lady was really angry that they burnt her books. My sister and parents stayed up the rest of the night. And the next day they went to church to ask the priest what it could be. The priest said the house was cursed and that we should move out. 
and my parents began looking right away for a new house to move into. Jose came back home. My sister told them that she was in the bathroom, and she saw the lady appear out of thin air, and then apparently the lady asked for a favor. She said that the lady wanted my dad to open the chimney and clean it out. It was so late my parents called my uncle to tell him if he could come over the next day, to which he agreed. The next day, when my uncle did come over, they proceeded to open the chimney up that was previously closed with bricks, and wasn't sure as they opened the bottom, they found nothing. So they decided to open the top where smoke comes out, and as soon as they did, the wind almost knocked my dad off the ladder. He thought it was strange, but brushed it off. And when they finished, they found bones and ash. My dad got really scared at that point. He put the bricks back and went to the store and bought concrete and sealed the chimney off. My dad and uncle went inside and drank some beers. And my uncle offered my dad some space in his house while they found a house to move into. The next day, we packed up and left. Some time after that, my dad got a house that we moved into, and everything went back to normal. And my sister, fortunately, stopped seeing the lady. This next event happened two or three years after we moved. My dad decided to move us to a bigger house, which seemed normal. On one night, my sister awoke and saw a black shadow on the side of her bed. She thought it was just her imagination. So she tried to fall back asleep, but the next day she told my parents, and they just assumed she was tired. A week after, my brother started seeing stuff too. He claimed he saw multiple shadows in his bedroom, and eventually my brother started ignoring the shadows. Then one night he woke up and saw a shadow right in front of him, and another one by the door. The shadow then started whispering, but my brother couldn't make out any words. He then started praying. And the shadow vanished. When he went to my parents' room to tell them what happened, they told him he was tired and that it was all in his imagination. So my brother returned to his room to sleep, and never saw anything afterwards. A few years passed, and my sisters moved out. And one day, my sister came to visit and had to use the bathroom. So she went to my parents' room to use theirs, since the others were occupied. She was doing her business when all of a sudden she got goosebumps, looked next to her, and claimed she saw the Grim Reaper, and started screaming. And my parents heard her screams. My parents ran to the bathroom and asked her what happened, and they found her on the floor crying. My sister said the Grim Reaper tried to take her. She then showed my parents her arm, and there were three scratch marks on it. She then left. And didn't return for a few more weeks for another visit. This final experience is my own. One summer day, I was sleeping in my bed and awoke as I had to use the bathroom. As I went to use it, I came back and felt a strange vibe in my room, so turned off the air conditioner and just stood in the doorway. Then the bed all of a sudden began shaking uncontrollably. I got scared and ran to my parents' room. My dad was on a business trip and wasn't in town, so I jumped on the bed and I woke my mum and told her what was going on. My mum told me to stop playing games and return to sleep. I told her that I wasn't playing a game, and that we should go check on the bed. We both sat there quietly, listening, and she could hear my bed shaking. We started praying, and a few seconds later, the bed stopped. I was so scared. I asked my mum if I could sleep with her, and she agreed. And I fell asleep in her arms. The next day, my mum sprayed some holy water all over the room, and since then, I've had no further experiences. I was sixteen when this occurrence happened. It was two forty-ish in the morning. I tend to stay up late. It's something I did a lot in my teenage years. I went out to the kitchen to fill my water bottle up, and I also ended up grabbing a snack. As I turned to go back to my room, I saw something through my sliding glass door. I should reiterate, I was living in an apartment at the time, all the way up on the third floor. 
I thought I was just seeing something, but I started to walk over to the door when it got closer. I'm telling you, I just about crapped myself. I ran to my room so fast, it really freaked me out. Also, after that had happened, it occurred many other occasions. I'm so glad we finally moved out of that place. So many things happened. Today I woke up very tired to see this short but lanky humanoid figure. It was like a naked grey child with a faceless oval head. It also did not seem entirely physical. Immediately after me seeing it, it ran and jumped onto the floor out of my view. I hesitated for a second, but still very quickly sat up to see where it went, and it was gone. My mother then walked in immediately afterwards, and asked why I had that look on my face. I stayed silent and said I didn't know. I tried going back to sleep, but heard my floor creaking, so I checked under the bed, which is where I thought this creature, which I was in denial of seeing at the time, would have been hiding. But it turns out, there were tons of containers under the bed, so it wouldn't have been able to hide in the room. I didn't actually know about the containers because I was sleeping in my parents' bed because my grandmother was visiting and using my room. The rest of my day had been weird, and I'd just been tired and depressed. I'm willing to accept that this was just a dream or something, but I wanted to know if this in any way sounds familiar to some creature or phenomenon something you guys may have heard of. <laughs>